morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Yesterday we gathered together, and as the service started out, Dad was opening the meeting, and he described to us what we were there for. And several of you were there. We were there for Brother Don's funeral. And we were also there to worship. And I say today, welcome to worship. We are here for worship today. Um, why then are you here? Did you come to worship God who... As the song that Cheryl selected said, on the cross he sealed my pardon. And how will you then worship when you come? What is it that you do that will be worship to such a God who came and lived his life as a man that like he created us? What, what will your worship be? Is it the songs that we sing? Because I look forward to coming to this place, to this sanctuary, and singing the songs, and reading the scriptures. Will that be the worship? Is that what will save you? Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 1 for an opening this morning. I want to look at a few verses here. The prophet Isaiah is speaking here as a prophet. He's speaking the words of God. Down in verse 11, he speaks for the Lord and asks this question. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Saith the Lord. So in the Old Testament, God had very clearly laid out how the sacrifices were to be and this was the method of worship that the people were supposed to use. And then this is how their sins would be paid for as they would bring the sacrifices. I am full of the burnt offering of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight, delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand? To tread or to trample my courts. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of the assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, this is shocking right here to me, this verse. This is why I ask us, what will our worship be? Because... When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. The writer of the Hebrews says in chapter 10, talking about the law. So these, these things that the nation of Israel were doing at God's command to worship, they weren't worshiping says the law can never make the comers or the worshipers perfect. So I say to us today to come to worship and to just sing a song is not worship. It can be. Why do we worship then? Hebrews 10 goes on to say that if that law, if those actions that they had done would have made the worshipers would have purged their sin there would have been no more conscience for sins for it is not possible it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats or their system of worship would make them perfect and any system of worship that we create today will not make us perfect Hebrews 10 goes on to talk about Jesus said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And it says that by that will, by which will, we are sanctified. So it is God that will save us. When we realize that, then out of us comes the worship. 
The worship is, is an expression of what is on the inside. It is that realization that I am a sinner and that there's nothing I can do about it except for the Lord Jesus Christ. Then when I realize that, when I recognize the significance of what he's done and that he's done it for me and how I am not able to do that for myself, I am compelled to worship him. And I will come and sing the songs and I will read the scriptures and therein is life. The word is alive. Isaiah continues on then in, in verse 16 and says, Wash you, make you clean, put away evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. So don't think that you can just come here and sing songs and be cleaned. That will not save you. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be wool. Here's how we do it. To that God that has sacrificed his only son for our salvation. To his Holy Spirit that calls us. We were dead in our sins. We had no idea until the Holy Spirit of God reached out to us. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Hebrews then 10 goes on and says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When we come to worship today, it needs to be an expression of an inward feeling that we have towards this almighty God who has done all for us. And a realization that of ourselves we are nothing, but with him then, he is everything. Ivan talked about in the Sunday school opening the events that had happened this week. And he concluded saying, in regard to the nation of Israel and the attack that they're experiencing, that in God's protection, it was just not time yet. But for us here today, it is time to worship. Because that sacrifice is perfect. It has saved us and we are saved. And out of the inside needs to come that worship, that true heart that is pure towards God in understanding or trying to understand all that he has done for us. So, before we go any further in this worship service, let's have prayer requests. If there's anything that we can call on God for you, I have a couple that were given to me. Um, I mentioned the land of Israel. Mary Sue Moss is currently in Jerusalem. Some of you have kept up with her. I believe she has a blog. And she is supposed to fly home Tuesday. Coming up. This was already planned because her visa was not renewed. Um, but she will then stay home, I guess, because of the unrest, the war that's going on. So pray for her safe flight home on Tuesday. Uh, there was a message also posted on our app. The Pleasant Ridge congregation had an election last night, and they elected Brother Jason St. John as minister, and they elected two deacons, Jacob Short and Josh St. John. I personally would like to ask you to pray for all of those men and their families. The prayer for a man when he's called to the leadership is amazing. You can feel it. I've experienced that myself, and I appreciate that of you all, and I would ask you to do that for these men, and we'll do that this morning. Are there any others? Jeff. Okay.
pray for Jeff's co-worker Jim Yarrow had his leg amputated because of say it again diabetes okay any any other prayer requests Cheryl So the eight-month-old son of Cheryl's friend is going to be having shoulder surgery. Pray for him and the family. Are there more prayer requests? If there aren't, oh, Bill has one. About missed it, yeah. Well said. Let's continue to pray for Sue. Any more? Pray for Dallas Flory after his surgery on Thursday. Dan. Um, our friend Cole, who's visited here a couple times, his grandfather passed away a couple days ago. Just pray for the family. So Cole's grandfather passed away a few days ago. Pray for him and his family. Camille. Camille's friend <coughs> shattered his. His Stephen Hess. Stephen Hess shattered his femur. We'll pray for him too. Are there any others? I still got room on the paper, so. <laughs> if not, let's bow in prayer. Father, we come to you in worship this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a glimpse by your Holy Spirit of your awesome power and your holiness and help us to realize what you have done for us and realize our sinful state and yet you came and your blood is so sufficient that we are totally cleansed. And when we realize that, it is with joy that we come to worship. And it is not just empty religion, but we come knowing that you're an all-powerful God, that you're alive, and that you care for each one of us individually, and that you care for us as a group. Um, I just pray for a better understanding of you, Father, and I pray that um, when we worship you, it, it would just be in spirit and in truth. Um, I want to pray for all of our requests. Mary Sue Moss is serving you in Israel. Uh, we pray that you would bring her home safe. I pray for our brothers at the Pleasant Ridge congregation that have been called to a position of leadership. I pray that they would seek your Holy Spirit, and we know, Lord, that you will guide them. We want to be a support in whatever way we can, and the first thing we do today is pray for them, Father. Um, pray for Jeff's co-worker, Jim, and the health issues he's having. He's had his leg amputated. This changes his life dramatically. So we pray uh, for his faith to continue, um, even in this challenge in his life, and that, that you would... Build him up and build his wife up and, and, and be um, support to them as they go through this challenge in life. Pray for Cheryl's friend. This, this young baby will have a surgery and seems so early in life. Just pray, Lord, for their family and, again, that their faith will be built up through these challenges. And we pray for doctors on, on such a small child with such potential that you will... Uh, work in their life and, and bring about the plan you have for them and they will understand it and be resting in you. Sister Sue, I pray for her. It's been uh, a tough week and yet we have the hope of the resurrection. We know that Brother Don will live again. We know that his soul is eternal and that he's with you and we rest in that 
We pray that um, Sue can, can go through these days and that her faith will not fail uh, because of this that you have called her to now and that you will empower us as her church family. Give us wisdom to, to know and to be there to help her when she needs it. Pray for Brother Dallas Flory um, after his surgery. This cancer has continued to plague him. I pray that his faith will not fail because of this. But I pray that your name will be glorified and that you will be built up and that any that see this can, can realize that it is you that, that saves us, yes, and that it is you that gives all of the blessings. Um, were he to be healed, it would be because of you. I pray for our friend Cole and our brother. Uh, he's been coming here some, and his family has challenges. He has health challenges, and now his grandfather has passed away. So again, a death, and yet we realize, um, Lord, that you are in control, and you bring these events about, and we rest in you, and we pray that Cole and his family can as well. Pray for Stephen Hess and the health challenges that he's having um, as he goes through this um, problem in his body. We just pray that as you've created him, he can heal and be well again. Lord, we know that our prayers are not too much for you. You are an almighty God and you deserve our worship. So we give it to you willingly today, not out of thinking that we have to, but we are compelled to do it because of a realization of what you have done for us. So thank you, Lord. Um, I do want to pray for Brother David as we continue this service that the message will be clear and that you will be glorified. I pray that your spirit will dwell in him and that you will speak through him and all of us will have ready hearts to receive your message. Thank you in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Well, I invite you to uh, take a look at the screen here. There's a lot of information that to, to, you can study it as we go through. You're going to notice some things as we talk, as we look into a few scriptures, that uh, some of these words are going to come alive as to where they fit in to all of this. Our subject today is reconciliation, and uh, we're going to be looking at the big picture things of our need for reconciliation to God. But you and I, or me and you, live right down here. So this is me, and that's you. Now, Ivan, between those two, which one of these is, do you identify with? You're the me. Okay, so in every situation, we all have our perspective. And so in all these situations, we are all the me, and the person that we may be living with or, or having a conflict with and some need to be reconciled to, they're the you in this diagram. Okay. So, in this situation down here, there is a need sometimes for reconciliation. But most of what this is all about is our need for reconciliation to God. And that's where our primary thoughts are going to be here today. But there are situations that come about right here <clears throat> between me and you. Because there's sometimes there's conflicts arise. There's uh, you know, anguish and, and difficulties and People get mi mixed up and on the cross sides and, and misunderstandings occur. And all those kind of things can happen. <laughs> and we need to understand something else about the word reconcile. Actually, there's only one place in the Bible where it talks about be reconciled to your brother. Now, we often think of Matthew 18. And the key phrase to Matthew 18 is to gain your brother. And, and essentially, that's the concept of reconciling with your brother. But in that root of that word, you have the word conciliation, or conciliate, or making conciliatory moves or words to people. And that's what happens with you and I. When we are trying to gain our brother, when we're trying to be reconciled to our brother, sometimes we have to make some sort of move toward them, some conciliatory actions or words, in order to come to a place where you can be reconciled or to gain your brother. In 1954, there was a young man, 24 years old, in Paris. He was an unknown journalist for a Jewish newspaper. Ten years before, he had been in a Nazi concentration camp. 14-year-old teenager Jew in a concentration camp. Ten years later, he's now an unknown journalist, and he goes to meet a man in France there who uh, was a well-known uh, writer, and, and he, was, he was an expert in, in French politics, and his Jewish newspaper wanted him to go and address this man and ask him questions, this Francois um, Marquette, let's see, Mariac. So he went to this Francois's apartment to interview him about French politics, and he invited him in. He was a much older man than this uh, this individual was Eli Weissel, and you may have heard of this man's name before. So Eli walks in, he's really nervous, and he's just, he knows this man is a, he's, he's just a, a notable writer in France, and he's an expert, and they sit down, and they start talking a little bit, and he's got his, all of his questions in front of him, and he's very anxious to, to start the interview, but this Francois, all he can talk about is Jesus, and it seemed like every point, he would keep trying to change the conversation and get on to politics. And everything they talked about, he kept bringing it back to Jesus. Because this man was a very faithful Christian as well, this Francois. <clears throat> so finally, this just frustrated him to no end. And he got really upset because he was, you know, he was just 10 years out of a concentration camp. And having experienced what it means to have Christians who would pour out upon him that you are responsible for the death of Jesus Christ and, and all that went with the Nazi punishments and persecutions and all the death that he had seen. And he just couldn't take it anymore. And he finally put away his pencil and put down his pad and he closed his books and he stood up and he said this to Francois. He said, sir, he said to the still-seated Mariac, you speak of Christ. Christians love to speak of him, the passion of Christ, the agony of Christ, the death of Christ. In your religion, that is all you speak of. 
Well, I want you to know that 10 years ago, not very far from here, I knew Jewish children, every one of whom suffered a thousand times more, six million times more than Christ on the cross. And we don't speak about them. Can you understand that, sir? We don't speak about them. And he walked out. Francois was stunned. But he followed him quickly and caught him at the elevator and begged him to come back in. That was a conciliatory move. He reached back out to this young man that was so deeply offended. And he drew him back in, and they sat back down, and Francois sat there and just wept. And finally, Eli looked at him and started, began to apologize for the things he had just said. He said, no, no, don't, don't apologize. Tell me. Tell me what you experienced. Tell me about the trains. Tell me about the camps. Tell me about the deaths and the people that you were with. And he said, it's too, it's too hard. I can't talk about it. He said, you have to talk. Why haven't you ever put this in writing? He said, I made a vow of silence. He said, you have to break that. You must put this in writing. Ten years later, Eli Weissel published a very famous book called Night on the experiences of the Holocaust from the Jewish point of view. He won a lot of awards and medals and things for that. He even became a Nobel Peace Prize recipient because of that book ten years later. <clears throat> and Francois and, and Eli became lifelong friends. <clears throat> I tell that simply because you and I are living right down here. And sometimes we get crossed with people. But it's necessary that we would reach to them because you have this mutual animosity or this mutual problem between you and you have to move toward each other in order to become reconciled. And that's exactly what Francois did that day. Now I tell you that because with God... Reconciliation is completely different. This is a little paragraph out of a thing called Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary, the Old and New Testament words and so forth. But he says in this little paragraph, it says this on reconciliation, not once is God said to be reconciled. This is why I say with God it's different. Not once is God said to be reconciled. The enmity is alone on our part. It was we who needed to be reconciled to God, not God to us. See, in the big picture, the kingdom picture, we need to really understand this, that God doesn't need to be reconciled to us, but we certainly do. And that's the only way it works. And this is propitiation, Propitiation is Jesus Christ. Propitiation is, is, these are some of the words we give, some of the descriptions of Jesus Christ. He is our propitiation, the perfect sacrifice. He is the atonement. He's that sacrifice also. He's the justifier. He's our redeemer. He's our savior. He is everything that we needed, and that came from God for us so that we could be reconciled back up to God. And it is, his, it is propitiation which his righteousness and mercy have provided that makes the reconciliation possible to those who believe. This little dotted line in the middle of the page here, this is that moment of faith and belief that I hope all of you have come to. And when you went from being unreconciled to God to being reconciled to God, it was in a moment of faith and belief and you went from being an old man to a new creature. What a big change that is. But this describes you and I. Before we come to God, we're over here, we're unreconciled to God. And why is that? It's because of sin. The Bible calls us ungodly. We were sinners, we were enemies. But what's really amazing about this, those three words there, and we'll get to that in just a moment in, in Romans 
that those three words describe us when Jesus Christ went to the cross for you and I, we were ungodly sinners and the enemies of God. And at that moment, Jesus died for you and me. That's amazing. That's totally amazing. Unreconciled by sin. <clears throat> and when we're in that state, we are totally exposed to God's wrath. That's an important understanding. Completely exposed to when judgment day comes, there is nothing left but the wrath of God to be poured out upon us. But by belief and faith, <clears throat> we can become this. We're reconciled by Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, the one Jesus who became the Christ, who went to the cross for you and I, and those that believe in him. It says we are made the righteousness of God because we become reconciled. We invite you to turn to Romans chapter 4. Let's look at a few things there. Because re reconciliation with God is so completely different of all that he did for us. Romans chapter 5, we'll just pull out a few verses here beginning in verse 6. And watch what goes on here. What is, watch what's being said here to help us understand reconciliation to God. Romans 5 beginning in verse 6. Even as David, <coughs> excuse me, wrong chapter, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And these three words are right here in this passage. The ungodly, the sinners, the enemies of God. That's who Jesus died for. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That has to really hit hard to realize that Jesus went to the cross for me when I was completely unreconciled to him. He did that for every man. And invites every man to be reconciled to God and to come to belief so that we can become reconciled to him. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> justified. We, that this action of Jesus Christ upon the cross put us in a position where we are justified in God's eyes and that we will not see that wrath of God in an eternal state. He is our justifier, saves us from wrath. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you see those two phrases that are in there? We are reconciled by his death. Just a few weeks ago, we were celebrating the Resurrection Sunday, and we had, we had Friday that celebrating the day that he went to the cross for you and I. We were reconciled by his death. By Sunday morning, we are saved by his life. That's the reason he was resurrected, to prove to us that he lives forever. And so what he did on the, upon the cross was our reconciliation. It was our justification. It took care of all those legal matters. And then he says, but I want you to understand, you're going to live with me forever. And so we, we are saved by his resurrected life. What an amazing set of phrases right there. And verse 11 then, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. It's interesting as we, as we read and study some of these passages, some people have written to say that phrase, now receive the atonement, maybe could be improved on. Now, I know some of you, some of you think KJV is like the only thing we should ever read. <laughs> but anyway, you look into some other translations of this, and it comes out and it says, and now we have received the reconciliation. So let's understand that just a little. How is that why has that become a, a, an argument? 
because when Jesus went to the cross, he was our propitiation. He was our atonement. And, and he took that atonement and took it to the Father and said, I am paying for all of these people. And then we receive the result of that, which is reconciliation to God. So what we received, we didn't receive the, the atonement of Jesus Christ. God did. We received the result, which is our reconciliation to God. So if you want to write that in there as an extra word, that we receive the atonement slash reconciliation, maybe it gives a little more understanding to that. I want you to turn also to, over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll pick it up at verse 14. Verse 14, it says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What a, what a picture that is. It says the love of Christ constrained. That's like, that's, where, that's our security in God. That's a, that's a great big bear hug from God. That he has wrapped us up in his love. He has saved us. And that we should then turn around and dedicate our life to live for him who died for us. Verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And you might look at that phrase and think, I don't know what that verse just said. I think what it's saying was that he even knew Jesus Christ in the flesh, and yet now he's saying, I don't know any man after the flesh anymore because he has a different view a kingdom view of people. I'm going to have a kingdom view of people to look at them in the spirit world, to look at them in the kingdom world, to not ever look at a person again as just a person. They're either a person who is reconciled to God or they're not reconciled to God, and they need to be. And that's what he's emphasizing there, that it just gives him the motivation to not think about people as just fleshly people, but think about them in the spirit. Therefore, in verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, follow along in the next couple of verses here, because he, first he says that you are, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Then he's going to say something about we are given the word of reconciliation. And then he's going to say that we are ambassadors of reconciliation or of Christ. So he elaborates on this just a little bit. <clears throat> but he points out there so clearly that God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now, the next phrase is like a definition. This is God's definition of what it means to be reconciled. He says, when he was, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, here's the definition, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Isn't that amazing? That reconciliation means that God no longer looks at us and imputes or puts it on our account because Jesus took, a care, took care of all of that for you and I. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did, did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. And so he, he told us three things there. That we are given this ministry of reconciliation, we're given the word of reconciliation, and we're to become ambassadors for Christ. Now some people would interpret that to say, let's see, now I, I've been given the ministry of reconciliation, so I'm, I am like gifted at reconciling people. Is that really accurate? <laughs> I'm not sure that that's really that what, exactly what that means. What it means is that God has placed us in the kingdom to say, you have been reconciled. 
you are reconciled unto God, and I want you to go out and tell other people with your words and the things that you're doing in ministry to talk about the reconciliation that is available. And so that is the, that is the text, that is the message that I want you to go forth as an ambassador of me to go forth and say, you can be reconciled to God. Have belief, have faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you. Even though you are a sinner and you think maybe that there's no way that God could ever accept you, he already died for you because of that. And that's what we are to go and proclaim as we talk to people. That reconciliation is available. We don't have to exist like this, completely exposed to wrath. Jesus came and took care of it so that we can become the righteousness of God and have a hope of heaven that is eternal. So that's our ministry, that's our word, that's our ambassadorship, is to go about and beseech others to be reconciled to God. He ends with verse 20 there. And then in 21 he says, For he, meaning Jesus, hath made him, I mean, excuse me, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. And Jesus knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is pretty hard to understand. Even though I'm still living in this mortal life, this mortal body, God says, I have made you to be the righteousness of God. I want you to meditate on some of those things. (laughs) Now, the plan or the fulfillment of all that, of course, is in eternity. But he says, while you're here in this life, you are a reconciled person, and also you have this me-you life going on, too. Maybe both of you are reconciled people, and you have this going on right here. We'll get to that more in just a moment. So, being reconciled unto God, how should we then live when we're in the me-you conflict? Animosity, misunderstanding, what happens there? Both of you are reconciled unto God. There's times when you're, maybe you're reconciled and the other person isn't, maybe they're over in this category. You never know exactly on some of those things, but when you know clearly that, and the Bible talks about, talks about being reconciled to your brother, and we'll go to that here. This, this is where we're, Matthew 5, 21. This is the only place in the Bible where it says, be reconciled to your brother. And, it, and in Matthew 18, it's addressing the whole concept. <clears throat> when you have found that there's an offense between two that are brothers, That's what Matthew 18 is all about. Where you have two two people that are reconciled to God, interacting and maybe cross-wired at the same time. In this passage here, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest there that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother. This is the only place that says this. And then come. And offer the gift. And the very next words are this. Agree with thine adversary quickly. While that art art in the way with him. At the beginning we were talking about conciliatory moves or words. Where you're trying to reach out to that person. And find a way to agree with them. This is talking about agreeing with your adversary quickly. There's a sense of urgency here, but it's the point of it is to go to each other. And this is what Matthew, this needs to be our motivation for Matthew 18, to go to our brother quickly because there's some disagreement or some misunderstanding that's going on and you need to find a way to hear each other out. That whole phrase of gain thy brother is also in the context of hearing the person out. And that they would hear you out as well. And in that hearing of each other, that's where you can find ways to agree with each other on something. That may be a challenge sometimes when you think, 
Well, I'm 100% right, so I'm going to go do Matthew 18. 100% right? I, I doubt it. <clears throat> I think in every situation, there's always something that you could look at your own self and say, yep, you're right. I did that. Will you forgive me? And that's, that's conciliation. That's working those things out to hear each other in order to gain your brother. <clears throat> Just a couple of verses here in 1 John 4, 9 through 11. And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Do you hear John 3.16 and that's the same person wrote this, okay? Same concept, John 3.16. But here he's writing it in 1 John many, many years later. And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. What, a, what an amazing reasoning that he gives us here. The, the, the gospel is reasonable. <clears throat> when you understand all that God has done to take his only son and say, now you go into the world, be, take on a man's body, and you actually experience death upon the cross for the sins of every person who was that sinner, that, that enemy of God. And you do that for them. And that was, motiv was motivated because of love. That he gave us an opportunity to be reconciled. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And even so amazingly, <clears throat> when we are both standing there reconciled unto God, and we're in conflict, I hope that would help us to understand the need to go quickly, the need to hear out the other person, and to agree with things as fast as possible so that you could reestablish, restore, reconcile that relationship. And I want to share with you one last thing. <clears throat> we saw something recently that was describing the Greek understanding of the phrase, it is finished, that he gave us on the cross. What did Jesus finish on the cross? In the Greek understanding of that, this person that was explaining it was saying that there's a, there's a business meaning for it is finished. And it means very clearly that the debt that was there, the debt that you owed was completely paid and the account is gone. It has been totally finished. It also has a judicial meaning that you may have been convicted of sin and given the sentence, but your sentence for that is completely finished and come to its final end, and the, it's, the record is completely wiped away. And it also has a military meaning that there's no more action need, there's no more, uh, nothing else to be conquered about it. The war is over. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and I, so that we could be reconciled unto him. Would you join me in prayer? <clears throat> oh, Father, Lord God, our Father in heaven, 
We thank you that Jesus came into this world, that he came and looked like us, and he lived the life similar to us, Father, and he experienced all of the things that he needed to do to fulfill your will, to become our atonement, to become our redeemer, to become our justifier. Oh, Father, we just thank you that those things are finished and that we have the opportunity to go and to proclaim that word into the world that's around us. Oh, Father, and help us if we are individually not sure of what side of, of re that reconciliation or unreconciled condition we're in, Father, that we would come to you and beg for an understanding so we can come and have faith and belief and become reconciled before you. Father, we just pray for those that are sitting here today that aren't sure what their condition before you is. Well, Father, we just know that you can make us feel sure. You can make us understand that we are accepted in the beloved and that we are your children and that we have a life and an inheritance that is eternal. Oh, Father, we just pray for each one that has any confusion about this, Father, that they would come to a full assurance and, and a full knowledge of faith and belief in you. Oh, Father, we just pray also for those that were prayed for earlier that are suffering and dealing with so many conditions in life. We pray for our sister Sue that you will continue to raise her and to fill her and to surround her with your love and that great big bear hug from you that we were talking about earlier. Oh, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each one that is here. We pray for your word to go out into the hearts, into the minds, and to cause reflection in the days to come. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's have a song. sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. Iniquity so vast has blotted out at last my Sins are all covered by the blood. Burden I carry now, I am set free for. Jesus has lifted my load. Oh, the love and the grace I received in place when he put my sins under the blood. They are covered by the blood. They are covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. Precious blood, my iniquity so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. Can they understand why he
want to thank each of you for being here today, especially if you're a visitor. And we just invite you to come back at any time and join in here with us. What uh, announcements come to mind that need to be included at this time? Yes. Uh, next Sunday, I think Phil, Brother Phil is on to preach. Pray for him this week, but uh, afternoon or evening there will be a children's service, and that time will be announced. Okay, so Brother oh. Phil. We already said 6 o'clock. Maybe that's already been announced. Okay, so we're looking forward to, for Phil to speak next Sunday, and then uh, there will be a children's service at 6 o'clock Sunday evening. Excuse me? What time? Can you mean what time? 6.30. Okay, 6.30. <laughs> Thank you. Come at 6 if you want. Have some fellowship. <laughs> okay, anything else? Yes, Bill. Uh, there will be men's meeting this Thursday night at 7. No, 6.30. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> men's meeting, 6.30. Okay, men's meeting Thursday night, 6.30 here at the church. Anything else? Okay, thank you for being here. We just pray the Lord's blessing upon you as you go through the week and, and just be in the Word and uh, meditate in the, in the glory of the, that, that we have in the Word of God. Thank you.